Hello, and welcome to What is Metamodern Conversations. I'm Greg Dember, and my co-host is Linda Seriello. And um, what we do on this channel is we explore metamodernism in various aspects of the arts and culture. And today we're focusing on metamodernism in television with our guest, Ariel Bernstein. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here, Ariel. I'm just gonna do a brief introduction. You are a DC-based writer and cultural critic. Your work's been featured in The Guardian, The Atlantic, AV Club, and numerous other publications. And you're also a former editor and interviewer for The Rumpus and generally interested in modern storytelling and how essays, books, films, TV shows, and digital communications connect us to each other and to the world. You're professor of the writing studies program at American University, and you recently taught a class called Empathy in a Digital Age, and you write fiction. And I hear that you're currently working on a novel. So uh, welcome, Ariel, and uh, please, add any additions or corrections to that introduction if you'd like to. Oh, Linda, that was absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, I'm just so delighted to be here and to be able to talk about metamodernism with both of you today. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's great to finally be talking. Um, so I guess how we originally connected was, um, I belatedly got into BoJack Horseman after people had been urging me to watch it for quite a while. Um, this was like about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And um, I started just really binging and marathoning it and Googling, I found one of your articles and I was really intrigued, not just by you know the, the good writing, but also the way you talked about um, and interpreted Bojack Horseman with your emphasis on empathy and um, responsibility, or I'm not sure if that was your term, but it it seemed like you were kind of thinking through a metamodernism lens, though you may not have had that term at your disposal. Um, and then, so that's kind of the reason why I reached out to you was to sort of see if if this metamodernism concept made sense to you. And here we are. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was so excited to kind of discover this term for something that I had been really interested in exploring for such a long time. You know, my focus is on emotions and affect and empathy and intimacy, especially in a digital context. And so learning this word that really kind of captured a lot of the pop culture interest that I've had for such a long time. And I know that some of the research that I've done about Bojack Horseman, for example, and when I've worked with students who've also been interested in Bojack, um, some of what I've found has used the term postmodern to describe it. When I, when I learned the term metamodern, it seemed to be so much more specific and kind of capturing um, the ethos and sensibility of the show and also kind of capturing how I feel like one of the things I love about Bojack is there's just this wonderful community. Like I know if someone hmm also says that they love Bojack, that we're probably going to be friends. We're probably going to find <laughs> something common. Um, there's just a certain sensibility. And for me, um, metamodernism seems to be capturing so much of that sensibility. Yeah. Um, would it help if I explained kind of the difference between postmodernism and metamodernism? Because I've prepared a little statement. So distinguishing metamodernism from postmodernism, specifically in regards to television, postmodern television in the 80s and 90s dwelled largely in the ironic dimension, often reminding the viewer that they were watching a television show and of the limits of the medium and the limits of meaning making in general. So you have a show like Seinfeld, which literally proclaimed itself to be a show about nothing. The shows were clever and funny and enjoyable, but there was generally an emotional remove from sincere feeling. With metamodern television, beginning a few years before 2000, you retain the playfulness and self-awareness of postmodern television, but a sense of sincerity and interest in people's interiority is braided with that postmodern playfulness. So you get a show like Bojack Horseman or Freaks and Geeks or Community or Girls or Rami where there is very much that playful self-aware aspect, but it's not simply playfulness for the sake of being clever, but rather it kind of opens up a space where a more serious commitment to depth becomes possible. Do, do folks agree? 
Yeah, I mean, I in fact, I could say that uh, when I first tried to watch BoJack, it was a few years ago, and I couldn't get into it. I was not immediately drawn in. Um, but when I went back a second time, because I knew we were going to be speaking, after about uh, episode nine of se uh, first season, I kind of got it. And I was like, okay, I see what's happening here. And I asked myself why, what was it that I wasn't quite getting? And I think it really did come down to that I was reading it, I don't know whether through a postmodern lens or I was just, what I was feeling was the, the postmodern um, kind of uh, the snarkiness coming through. And that was before we really get a really good chance to see what's so lovable about Bojack. And so he's kind of, for a while he comes off, it's like they make us wait for a little bit to see what's lovable about him in order to mm -hmm help us uh, you know, show that people with a, a great deal of um, you know, unredeemable qualities or flaws um, are still gonna end up you know, having these important journeys we can go through with them. But yeah, it was because I was thinking in a postmodern sense, I think that I, I didn't catch some of that metamodernism. I feel like some of it is also this idea of the, the male anti-hero when Bojack first came out, which is such a part of our cultural imagination. I know one of the conversations people had as well, how is this new? It's just that there's an animated horse and there's like funny, like looking different animals in it. Um, and for me, that metamodern sensibility that both of you have been studying really kind of captures the beauty of Bojack and how it differentiates itself from other, other um, shows that are kind of in the same genre. Do you really see a kind of a um, a flawed protagonist or an anti-hero or an, like an, uh, sometimes we use the term ordinary savior in a lot of metamodern shows, a lot of the ones we've mentioned, uh, and that also, um, I don't know if The Good Place, maybe we didn't mention, or Fleabag. It, it, it has something to do, I think, with um, a kind of stunted growth, and that sometimes goes along with Either, either a childlike quality or sense of wonder or an unwillingness to accept the adult world of, of routinization. So there is this playfulness that gets injected and, and we actually want to see whether they're going to you know, mature in a certain way or maybe they won't. And you've said some really interesting things I think in your articles about Bojack, about how much um, there is to excavate the sort of the journey of what it means to be a person, I think you said at one point. Oh, I, I just realized that um, there's probably something we should clarify for our audience, those of whom may not have ever watched BoJack Horseman, because, you know, I was just like listening to what you were saying, Ariel, through the ears of a, such an audience person, and you just kind of like, you just kind of nonchalantly say, yeah, it's animated and it's about a horse, you know, <laughs> and then we carry on. So um, when you begin watching BoJack Horseman, you will see that it's an animated television show where about half of the characters are human and about half of the characters are anthropomorphized animals. Um, and the, you know, the main character as this horse, um, Bojack, who, you know, walks upright, but has like very horsey features. And, you know, there's a dog named Mr. Peanut Butter, and there's a cat named Princess Caroline. And um, Keith Olbermann does a cameo voicing a newscaster who's a whale and um, things like that. And, and Bojack is this kind of washed up um, former sitcom star from the 90s, but still very charming, charismatic um, figure. And he's an alcoholic and he's mean to people and he shoots himself in the foot a lot of the time. I, I, I feel like so much happens in Bojack. And for me, what's most exciting about it is really um, the tremendous sense of compassion that's displayed towards incredibly imperfect characters. And for me, like the, um, the animated aspect of the show is just delight. I've often thought about what would Bojack be if, you know, it didn't have the sort of animated background. Well, I think it's really interesting and evocative. And I think it brings out, you know, I was looking through um, the Metamodern website and I saw how there were different criteria. And one of the things had to do with, I think a kind of meta cuteness mm -hmm. is that, the, that you all use. And I was thinking yeah. about how that 
really connects to um, some of the work that Bojack is doing. You know, every time you're watching an episode, you just, there's always something of interest that's like amusing, um, interesting, really in depth that's happening on the scene. So there's so many different layers um, to just sort of our emotional engagement with the series. And I know Bojack also has um, the, the term that people often use to describe it is, oh, it's the sad horse show. And one of the things that I'm really committed to is exploring how Bojack does have to do a lot about sadness and mental health, but I think it also there's, for me as a viewer, there's just so much joy in Bojack. And that's something that I think is often missing in our conversation. I think it's very connected to some of the metamodern themes. I, I think that's really key as well. And in fact, I would love to read one of my favorite quotes from your essay about how uh, Bojack became the most empathetic TV show. I paraphrasing the title, <laughs> but it's uh, you said um, Bojack Horseman's greatest strength is its insistence that the work involved in doing the right thing is compelling in its own right. However, it reflects on there's never going to be a happy ending in real life because the story and by extension, our stories as the viewers simply keep going. So uh, you wrote the series is less interested in providing a linear framework for understanding trauma or like a linear sort of healing journey um, than in exploring what we do with the things we inherit. So in this way, Bojack Horseman is, this is where I like, really liked your quote. It's the opposite of a sad show. It declares over and over that each of us has the potential to grow and be better and to change. Yeah, I think like the respect for um, characters that try is something that I've really, the longer I've been watching and analyzing TV shows, the more I appreciate that is that, you know, I, th I think that what viewers are really deeply engaged with is, you know, characters that seem real, that are authentic and that also keep trying. And so not having this sort of black and white. I think for a while, one of the um, confusions with the anti-hero was that we started getting some characters that were just kind of mean or were delving into characters that are just, um, you know, kind of cruel for the sake of being cruel. And I think that's definitely something that I know I as a viewer am like much less interested in than characters that are genuinely complicated. And I think that's something that Bojack really does well is has characters that on their surface, maybe we think, oh, it's just a cartoon, but that actually they're deeply invested in exploring what it means to be, what it means to be a person. Do you think that a fair and accurate way of distinguishing the pre-metamodern anti-hero from, I don't even know what our term for it is, but from the flawed hero in the metamodern is that um, the classic anti-hero, although it's, it's from the point of view of, of this kind of bad guy, emotionally, the viewer or the reader still sort of like abstractly is looking from the point of view of the victims or, you know, kind of of, of everybody else. Like you're seeing, it's, a, it's as if you're, you know, watching a security camera and it's focusing on the criminal. So they're the center of the show, but you're not really rooting for them, you're rooting for the people who are getting robbed. It's just that the story is being told from the point of view of the the bad guy. Where that that would be kind of the classic antihero. Whereas in the meta modern version of it, um, this person is bad, and they are you know creating victims here and there. But you can't help but actually root for them. And sometimes you're rooting for them to redeem themselves and become a better person. But sometimes um, you're actually just rooting for them to win in whatever little game that they've set up for themselves. Like even a micro win, it could be, you just want them to win in this one scene or for in this one way, even mm -hmm. though they're not redeemed, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, for me, it's about what you were saying earlier about that sense of ironic detachment versus genuine empathy. And I think that with these kinds of metamodern programs, the interest is in us actually, you know, even if a character is complicated and even if we don't necessarily want, there were many times watching Bojack where I did not want to be, um, and I don't think I ever identify with Bojack, but I could feel for Bojack. And to me, that's very much a part of um, what it means for, what it means that Bojack is kind of special as a program is that we really are 
asked to do two things at once. One thing, which is hold Bojack accountable to see really, um, you know, how his actions affect other people, but to also really feel genuine empathy and compassion for Bojack as an individual who's trying. You know, there's that really, I think one of the scenes that like captures a lot of that is when Bojack takes up running and he really <laughs> wants to sort of learn to run. And they have that wonderful scene with, I think, I don't know if the baboon character ever gets a name, but we see, this is where some of the art is so beautiful and interesting. We see this baboon run every single day alongside Bojack. And it <laughs> seems at first like it might just be a throwaway gag. And then we actually have at the end of that episode, we see Bojack fall down to the ground after really feeling like he can't actually get up that hill that he keeps trying to run up. Um, and the baboon actually comes over to him and says, you know, it gets better every day, basically. You have to keep doing it. That's the main thing. And to me, that is so much the heart of Bojack combining that, like, you think something is going to be a subtle gag. It ends up being something much deeper, yeah. much more fun for the storytelling. Um, and also just this beautiful moment of, like, we really want Bojack to get up that hill, even though we know that he might not make it. Um, what about the animal aspect of the show? Like, at first, it just seems like a gag, kind of. And and then, because I, I went through a little bit of the same thing as Linda did, like, like, why should I buy into a show where it seems random that some of the characters are animals? Like, why? Why is that a thing? But I think it is really important. I don't think you could tell the same story without it, but I don't know how to explain why. You know, it's interesting. I feel like that's also just part of the magic of Bojack. Like, I don't think that I could entirely encapsulate why it's so important that they're all, but I know that it would be a very different show without it. I think part of it has to do with these kinds of visual gags that we see that actually do become important to the storytelling. I think part of it is actually cutting what could be a really sad show, as we've kind of talked about a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Helping have moments of real genuine like delight. Um, so I know one of my favorite scenes in Bojack, which is actually a throwaway gag, but like Bojack gives Princess Caroline, the cat character, a mm -hmm. gift. And instead of actually having the gift, she just gets so exuberant about the paper and she's like, paper, hey, it's my favorite thing. And she tosses it up in the air. And this is this did not add to the plot in any capacity, but I, <laughs> it was very memorable to me. I just found it so charming and delightful. Um, and so for me, kind of, I guess, having that texture to the show uh, is one of the reasons that I really enjoy. And you're always kind of, even in the saddest or the most, um, I guess, dr dramatic kind of moments, you're always wondering, oh, is there going to be something that's going to just charm or delight me? about this world. And I guess <laughs> another thing for me, it's a kind of world building. The world of Bojack mm -hmm. relies on this kind of um, this weird, quirky kind of um, this world that's unlike anything I think that any of us have seen before. Yeah, that's, oh, that's great how you said that, that it's unlike anything we've seen before. So it's kind of, it's putting us into a little bit of a different frame of mind just from the get go. And, and yeah, for me, I found that in this, this hybrid of animals and humans initially baffling, and then eventually super poignant, like you're both talking about, it's reminding us that we're all these hybrids and that maybe at the core, everybody, we still have these unshakable animal natures within us. So like one, a couple of my favorites, and uh, you could argue that they're throwaway also, but so funny. Um, is with Mr. Peanut Butter because uh, he's this, you know, super affable, he's a golden lab, right? I think, um, but he's this super positive character. And, uh, you know, we get to see sort of the, the, the contagiousness, but also the limits of this just unbridled positivity um, because he also chases the mailman. He can't help himself <laughs> or he shakes off in the house and he can't help himself from doing it. <laughs> and then there's a really funny one with Diane, who's uh, they're having a fight about the fact that Mr. Peanut Butter threw a big birthday party for Diane, Diane is human. And Diane is a human yeah. and is his wife at the time. And he, she really did not want a birthday party. And uh, during the fight, she she says, Mr. Peanut Butter, I know you did this for the right reasons, something like that. And she says, and I know you're a good dog. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> and that that just reminding us how we as human individuals, we all inhabit these uh, hybrid animal natures to some extent or another alongside of our professional demeanors. 
Uh, Linda, I think that's so profound because there is a sense that we're um, that we are thinking about our own relationship to our like what can be what are things we can change and control or what are what things are just instinctual and I think the show absolutely is exploring that. Do you teach Bojack Horseman in your classes? You know, I As don't a... teach Bojack. Uh, you know, I, I so I teach mostly writing classes and I also oh, right. teach and empathy and emotions. Um, I have never okay, so I've been writing about TV now for a while, and I have never actually taught TV. I find TV challenging to think about teaching because in order to really appreciate a show, there's just so much you have to watch, and especially I couldn't imagine like which episode of Bojack would yeah. I select or. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to teach just one season? I would want to teach the entire season. And so I, fi I find that really, really challenging. But I will say that I thought that the, um, I become very interested in endings. And I thought that the ending of BoJack, which came, I think, a little bit earlier than any of us had wanted, um, but I thought they did such a beautiful job capturing really um, all the different tensions of the series and BoJack's arc and all the different character arcs. For me, it was incredibly satisfying. And so I, yeah, I feel like it's hard to choose one. I would want to, I would want to assign the entire series to anyone mm -hmm. who'd be taking that. Yeah. Well, the underwater episode where um, the whole thing takes place in this underwater world and not once do they like indicate that there's anything unusual about that. It's just like they go underwater and there's all these stores and shops and people living underwater and even Bojack can breathe down there somehow. Um, I mean, I think the, the supposition, I think, correct me if you think this is wrong, but is that there's a whole world going on underwater. There's all these creatures and all these, you know, beings, animals, entities that live down there, just the same as above yeah. ground. And so sometimes you're hanging out there because that's where they are. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It kind of, again, presents you with the fact that there is just so much more going on inside other people and other places and other worlds than you can you know take in at once as a person um well i i really love the final scene in in the i, I love the last few episodes in general and the second to last is really amazing in a completely different way the second to last episode could have been the fun finale in a sense where Bojack reconnects with all these dead people that have been important to him. Um, but the final scene of the final episode, because I was always kind of rooting for Bojack and Diane to get together. Um, and I think Bojack was always kind of secretly in love with her, or maybe not so secretly. Um, but the kind of love he has for her is not any he doesn't want her in any like really specific physical or social way. He just wants to be in her life. And um, in the final episode, it Are looks... you getting choked up? Yes, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> and in that final episode, they're on the roof and she's about to get married. And um, isn't she? No, Princess Caroline's getting married. Wait, who's getting married? Princess Carolyn's getting married and Diane shows Bojack her ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's engaged. She's They're engaged. At Princess Caroline's wedding, who also is a really important female figure in Bojack's life. And so she's getting married to someone. Diane's engaged to someone else. And at first, it seems like Diane is going to kind of, she's kind of saying like, you know what? I, it's been, this is going to be the end of our um, friendship. And then they just linger together on the roof a little bit longer than was intended. Um, and it's just super sweet and it, but it's not telling you what is really going to happen next, but it's just that moment. And I think that was the moment Bojack was I'm getting choked up again. That was the moment Bojack was waiting for kind of the, through the whole series. And, and it may have been enough for him. One of the things that I really love also in that final moment is how Diane and Bojack kind of share center stage because the show is called Bojack Horseman and it's so much about his arc. 
but I think that Diane as a character, and I don't know if this was their intention from the start, mm. but I think that watching both of their journeys towards better mental health, they're both incredibly talented people, exceptionally creative, who really struggle with depression. And so I think having um, both of those characters, we kind of see them together for me was also just such a perfect encapsulation of the series. Um, I'd be so curious if, if I was ever able to sort of talk to any of the creators of the show to right. kind of, um, ask them about Diane. Well, I, I would just be fangirling like crazy in general, <laughs> but I'm so curious to ask them about if that was their intention for Diane as well. Because um, for me, she was almost sharing that stage as like another, um, you know, central protagonist in the series. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I actually wanted to mention too that there's there's a couple instances as, as far as you know favorite episodes or ones that really stuck with us. It's a couple instances where someone, a character, is dealing with a mental health, you know, a breakdown really, and the animation changes such that the you know the internal the internality of the mind becomes you know visually represented by these sort of squiggles and um you know like aggressive looking and feeling um motions that are very inchoate and i thought it was absolutely beautifully it was astonishing to me how how well um you know they could really just seamlessly go from the the very you know clearly the the style of animation that they use throughout the whole thing to um, really take you inside in a way that you wouldn't be able to do it very easily with a non-animated show. And once again, I have another quote from you, Ariel, because I really liked how you, how you um, spoke to this in your article on uh, the magical earnestness of the new adult cartoon. And you had um, said that adult cartoons, which we're seeing more, are increasingly positioning themselves as a respite, respite from the cruelties of the world rather than a place to indulge bad behavior and that they illustrate how embracing a wider range of voices and we could even say you know types of worlds right um, is essential for nuanced and compassionate storytelling and that an emphasis on empathy empathy doesn't come at the expense of offbeat wild or gross humor Instead, today's new wave of smart, nuanced adult animation is earning viewers precisely because of its daring and the way it trusts audiences to tackle complexity. So I really liked, especially um, the way it trusts audiences, because I do feel like there's this almost reciprocal thing going on here. And you've spoken to it more than I've had a chance to even think about yet, but do you know what I mean by that sort of reciprocity? Yeah, for sure. I think that um, I, I think that there is a genuine sense, which which has been interesting in a digital era. You know, I'm always interested in the ways that we're sort of consuming television today. Like, I know um, one of the shows that we kind of talked about a little bit was WandaVision, and how mm -hmm. WandaVision had kind of meta modern quality as well, and how it also created the space of for communal. I think even communal grief, I'm gonna go as far as to say, we've had such a difficult year on so many levels. And I know in my empathy in a digital age class, at one point we were watching, we were reading a different text that had to do with grief. And one student in the chat, cause we're on Zoom, brings up WandaVision and everybody who's been watching WandaVision starts to bring up a few of the quotes that really resonated that I had mm. seen in digital spaces people talking about. And I think that there's something so exciting and beautiful about that, um, especially because I know that, you know, there's so much, hostility and toxicity online as well. And so for me, having these kinds of programs that really bring people together is such a such a beacon of hope, honestly, um, mm -hmm. and in very um, traumatic kind of times. Yeah, and if I could, just to cap that off, there's a few really lovely moments in BoJack in which the sentiment given is, we're all terrible. We're all terrible in some way, and therefore we're all okay. Or uh, it might even be the, no, this isn't the last episode because it was in season five. Diane is trying to talk uh, Bojack down from another, you know, case of him flogging himself for his, for his flaws. And he says, she says, there's no bad guys and no good guys. We're all just guys who do bad stuff sometimes and good stuff sometimes. And those, that's a, a sort of sentiment that comes up in a lot of metamodern television that we've been 
you know, working to identify. But what's interesting about that, uh, to be able to identify it, is it's almost becoming a kind of new normal in, it, it, it makes sense because this is a, we're saying, we're asserting this is a metamodern cultural shift that we're living in. And, you know, we've been tracking this since the mid 2000s. Um, so this, the visibility of this kind of sentiment um, increases, it becomes more of a norm. So it's paradoxically both easier and harder to distinguish metamodernism because it's becoming more normal. But there's a, um, a, a fellow I quoted in my dissertation who, uh, his name's Will Schoder. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a video essayist. Um, he says that the best TV shows of our age, this was 2017, aren't finding humor in the gaps that have developed between people anymore. They find humor in the absurd and awkward attempts by people trying to bridge those gaps. Hmm. They want to show us that humans can have real connections and sincerity for each other. So I really think of shows like Fleabag there, for example, and all the other shows that we've been talking about so far. Yeah, I'm so pro sincerity. I think there's a real hunger <laughs> for it. And I think, you know, I, I, you know, I was thinking about this when, when thinking about the time frame. Like, I've definitely came of age at a time of, I guess, great meta modern, like the transition towards meta modernism. But I think, I think there's a hunger for authenticity and sincerity. I think it's one of the reasons that so many of these shows have been successful, not just um, in terms of thinking about ideas deeply, but also really capturing our hearts. You know, yeah. and I think that those kinds of connections and having that. I think that sense of empathy and that sense of like, I mean, I mentioned this about Bojack Horseman, but I think it's true for The Good Place and it's good for Fleabag that if someone understands that sensibility, um, it's not just about appreciating the same piece of art, it's that they might understand who I am as a person. It's, it goes a little bit deeper, I think, than just an, a shared appreciation for, for a TV show. Right. For me, it goes much deeper than that. And I think that um, it's important to say that these shows, you know, the sincerity in these shows, it's not it's not just a throwback to a kind of pre-ironic culture. Um, they're very much living in the language of irony and referentiality and quirkiness and all these things. And it's like, I think that um, we've become a culture where you need you need some of that. Like that's that 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 kind of playfulness um and complexity is yeah, i'm just trying to think of a metaphor it's just like you just you expect that and if, if it's not there it doesn't seem like a smart good relevant contemporary show but what they're doing in these metamodern works is they're kind of taking that previously postmodern mentality as a starting point and then offering the sincerity um, kind of inside the packaging, maybe of the. Um... I have to. I have to ask this question because it's been sort of. I've been thinking about it since we kind of were talking about adult animation. So I feel like Rick and Morty, which I love Rick and Morty, and I mm -hmm. would consider more of that meta. Um, I, I feel like it's more meta modern because of, um, like, for example, the episode Pickle Rick, where we have this incredibly absurd situation where we have. Rick, the scientist in the series, has transformed himself into a pickle, and he's literally at like family therapy with a family that he generally treats pretty badly. He's incredibly arrogant, and he's really and for me, this this episode was just the quintessential kind of meta modern kind of moment. It has all those different layers. Um, but you know, Linda, when you were just saying about sort of bridging like different communities, I think that it's actually been much more um, controversial in terms of like some people see it as more of an ironic show entirely and some people see it as more of having that kind of heart and so there's been an interesting response I'm curious if either you are Rick and Morty fans or if you have any because to me it definitely it has those metamodern sensibilities but also kind of harkens back to that more traditional kind of postmodern sense of uh, yeah irony. I tried to watch Rick and Morty and I don't think I got through the first episode um I think this might just be really common with meta modern shows where even if you like meta modern stuff, um, you're you're likely to grab onto the postmodern ironic elements first. And potentially it's too much and and you reject it before you've given it a chance. And then as you stay with the show, the sincere elements come through. So, so I was 
I was victim of that pattern with Rick and Morty. Um, I would say, but what, and I don't want to deviate from your point, but the other thing I'm thinking about is how like, there's also just this really fun way in which these things are all connected. So like, isn't Rick and Morty Dan Harmon's show? Isn't he the, or not? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so Dan Harmon, the creator and showrunner of Community, a classic metamodern show, mm -hmm. um, you know, made Rick and Morty, and then Diane on BoJack Horseman is voiced by Alison Brie, who is Annie on Community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, it's funny is, yeah, I admit that the the reason I started to watch BoJack was actually because I had been re-binge watching Community. And I remembered that Alison Brie was in both. And so that shifted me over to BoJack and I got really engaged and found them to be similar in their sense of pacing. Honestly, that's kind of another topic, but um, there was a, a, a funny um, bit from Community season four that I kind of wanted to, uh, just throw into the conversation here. It relates to how um, uh, people learn lessons in whatever way is available to them. There's not like a, you know, a, a right outcome for everybody, a one size fits all. That's maybe another, you know, kind of characteristic of, of metamodern TV. So in this episode, you'll remember it when I describe it a bit. Um, they have a history professor who is going to give them a bad grade on their final group paper and so or project so they invite him to dinner at, for christmas and there's this weird competition going on with this professor um and then chang ties him up because well chang is insane um <laughs> but at some point and it's in, unclear who does it someone unties this professor and um he's been trying to make a point to them about their group dynamics being dysfunctional with a parallel to their history lesson about empires. And Jeff starts one of his soliloquies and he says, you know what you taught us tonight, professor, that yes, empires fall, but we're no empire. We're just a bunch of flawed, selfish people. And that's not our weakness, it's our strength. The one thing we can count on at any given moment is that the six of us are paying for a mistake made by one of us. That means that at any given moment, one of us is screwing up so badly that he or she is gonna forgive whoever screws up next. So, and he says, I'm gonna say that whoever untied the professor, I don't give a crap because I know that it was some flawed, selfish, weak and hopeless soul like me. So, you know, however his sort of backhanded logic stretched um, soliloquies, uh, whatever he's trying to do, he's trying to bring everybody back on track somehow. And you're laughing at him sort of, you know, hypnotizing the group with these speeches while this soft music comes in the background. Mm -hmm. and, and generally it comes in right when the most embarrassing admission is made about how, you know, flaws, again, this is a common motif here. So, you know, we, we feel that there's this feel good resolution coming and it's also sort of spoofing whether anyone really learned much at all. Although Abed is logging all of this as more data about how reality mm -hmm. mirrors TV at the same time. <laughs> when it's a, it's a classic Jeff Winger moment because, um, you know, you have to remember that he's trained as an attorney, as a litigator. Um, and so I don't know, he can he can deliver these really compelling, poignant, um, heart tugging speeches, but he's kind of a sociopath. So like he we you always wonder, does he really mean it? Or is he just doing that thing that attorneys do in the courtroom that they're so good at? But then you have to think, well, the fact that he could string these words and ideas and concepts together means it must come from somewhere in him or he wouldn't have thought of those things. And so it's just, it, it's this metamodern oscillation between interpreting him as a sociopathic manipulator and then interpreting him as like deep down inside, um, he's this really wise uh, kind of leader. Um, and then sort of also with the idea that like, well, it doesn't really matter because if he's having the beneficial effect on the other characters 
or even on us as the viewer, like as the viewer, you can just listen to these soliloquies that he gives and be motivated. And I, th I think I just think there's something really metamodern about that dynamic with Jeff. That it might not matter that he's got a lock on the truth about the situation or the moral you know, high ground. It may, usually it is pretty iffy whether he really is on the moral high ground or not. But like you said, yeah, we can still sort of lean into the message and still take from it. Yeah, it's, I feel like it's walking a tightrope, but you know, I, I was thinking about Seinfeld and I just started rewatching Seinfeld. I guess mm. I've, I've reached the state of the pandemic where I'm just, I'm on Hulu and I'm looking at all these much older shows and I, I, I really enjoy the sensibility too, but I do think the one thing about Seinfeld is that we don't have the expectation that these characters are gonna change. We're there for the irony, we're there for the fun. Yes. Um, and there's there's a true pleasure with that. Um, but I think there is that that interesting tightrope work that kind of does end up kind of pushing over to the edge of being, I think simply more hopeful is the sense that I get from metamodern stuff, that there is a sense that like, even though we're not sure about Jeff Winger, we really want him to kind of get there. I think mm -hmm. we, a lot of other characters in the group also want him to be the person that um, potentially he could be. And so I, I think that that sensibility is something that very much maybe lies at the heart of metamodern project. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's really making me connect to something when you said um, what the other characters want. They want that person to play that role. And I remember that so strongly from Buffy, where she, um, Buffy, Buffy the Vampire, Vampire Slayer. Slayer, she's in the role of Slayer. No one else can play that role. Um, and the whole series is a tension about how she'd like to just be a regular human, but she's in this role of savior and everybody else is, you know, lucky that she's playing that role for them. And another place that it really makes me think of, and Greg, I know you haven't seen this show, so you're at a deficit here, but it's The Good Place, because you have this character of Eleanor, who is, it turns out, this really unlikely savior. Um, and the one of the other main characters, who's a, you know, a, a supernatural figure, is explaining sort of why she ends up a savior. And he's saying, um, this is in season four, he's, it's called Girl from Arizona, and which is, she's just kind of a normal party girl from Arizona. And he says, human beings, it turns out are really weird. And I, as an angel or a demon, whatever we decide he is, will never truly understand what it is like to be one. So this meaning sort of saving humanity is a job for a human. And he says, Eleanor, you, you think you can't do this. You're not up to the task, but you're the only one who can do this, like it or not. The only one who can save humanity is a girl from Arizona, <laughs> meaning a very ordinary and very, you know, questionable morals, etc. Yeah, I think it's like um, interest in like the wonder of the ordinary is also something that I know as a viewer, I'm very interested in. Like I and it's interesting with Bojack because I do think that they explore this sort of fantastical world, but it's also very normal kind of human problems within yes. these, sort of, um, I guess, more I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but it's, it's normal problems within this more um, elaborate kind of construction. So oftentimes I feel like metamodern shows will have... Um, there'll be some type of, I, I really hesitate to call it a gimmick because I don't think it's gimmicky, but there's usually something that's just of interest that kind of gets the ball rolling. But then what we're really looking at is normal, ordinary struggles of ordinary people. I think that's right. And just to throw in um, can I, another connection I'm kind of making on the fly here is with a lot of these worlds we're talking about, um, the world building of, of Bojack with the animal hybrids with Rick and Morty set in, in, in space, um, I haven't watched the show really myself either, so I can't say much about that one. But and then the good place with this supernatural uh, afterlife setting, that we have some some aspect of it that's um, you know magical and the fantastical that we have to buy into, mm -hmm. or we're meant to buy into, and that then allows us. I mean, I guess I'm circling back to earlier conversation we were having. That allows us to really. Um, see more or give voice to a nuance as well but but especially just like that wider sense of the number of perspectives there are out there and questions there are that we're we're it 
elevating us to another realm elevates our ability to see how many um, how many vectors we're all working with the seen and the unseen and what's known to us and what isn't known to us. Yeah, I find that connects also to, I was just thinking about the, um, you know, so much of BoJack is about mental health. And I think a lot of these shows are also very much thinking about, you know, what happened in our childhoods that affected us today, like how, you know, so many of these series have characters that end up going to therapy and not in a like mm -hmm. ironic attached way, but like genuinely like, oh, they like went to therapy and yeah. they like, they get better and they learn. And yeah. So I just, I find it so interesting that these have also become kind of motifs that we see. Um, and, and I guess I just keep coming back to this idea of there is a sense of um, a propulsion towards hopefulness that I think is something that we don't necessarily see in other kind of anti-hero dramas and other places that are just as, you know, we're, we're looking at things that are serious, but we're also looking at them. Um, we, we, we have this, I guess we share the same hope as the other characters. We want these characters mm -hmm. to be better. We're there for the, we're there for the entirety of it. Yeah, that's kind of interesting um, therapy in these shows, like even Mr. Robot, which is oh yeah, like even Mr. Even Mr. Robot, Elliot has a therapist and she, his therapy and his therapist kind of come in and out of the show from the very beginning all the way through. Um, and, you know, and it's complicated and it, it, it's all warped by the weirdness of the show, but in some of those moments, he's more vulnerable and authentic, you know, than anywhere else, just in this therapist's office who doesn't really have any idea until eventually she does, but she doesn't have any idea what she's touching um, with Elliot. And I, I wouldn't say like Mr. Robot wouldn't be like my first example of a metamodern television show if I was trying to explain the concept to somebody. But I, I think it's meta modern, you know, it's a meta modern thriller. You know, a lot of our mm -hmm. meta modern um, TV shows and movies are kind of dramedies. And it's kind of, it's easy to identify the meta modernism in a dramedy because it's a drama and a comedy and it oscillates. But there's, I think there's a kind of meta modern, um, you know, you can have a meta modern adventure show or thriller or such. And I think Mr. Robot is one of those. Yeah, that gets us to an, a question we were kind of toying with trying to uh, to broach, and it's why are so many meta modern products comedic, or um, why is comedy effective at conveying the meta modern sensibility, and can we come up with more meta modern products that are not comedies at all? And just initially, I would say that ironesty, as you said, Greg, and then these quirky figures that we're talking about, the, the emphasis on the odd, the oddball, or the, the surprising quality, or the surprising, the surprise of the, the, the trait that somebody has that's actually going to be the one that saves the day for the moment. <laughs> um, so that's, that emphasizes the quirky and the comedic, really. I don't know. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that at all, or if you have thought of any other shows, either of you that aren't necessarily as comedic, but are expressing metamodern sensibility. I'm just excited about the word ironesty, which is <laughs> perhaps the, my, the favorite hybrid word that I've heard in a really long time. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's Greg's term, actually. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 I even made a really dorky website called I coined the word ironesty.com uh, with the idea that it might someday become a widespread term and I would need proof that I'm gonna, I'm gonna now try to use it like uh, I'll give you credit so it'll be on the syllabus wonderful yeah I was gonna um I was gonna say I guess I could think of something that didn't have comedy in it but I don't know that I'd want to like I you know it's interesting I, I always think of um, for me, the dramedy is just because I'm very interested in, in works that are bittersweet. For me, the dramedy is like that perfect kind of spot where it really is both looking at those tensions between joy and, you know, excitement at being alive and also the like, the difficult things that all of us, you know, also endure just being a person in the world and that it, that, part of that um, you know, I'm very interested in grief and how mm -hmm. it connects to these moments of joy. And so for me, um, that sense of comedy just seems important to the Metamodern project, but I'm sure we could think of some 
I don't know. You know what I'm starting to think as we go in this conversation is that that there's it's always going to be on a continuum of of the blend, you mm -hmm. know. And so the ones that are really salient as meta modern are like right down the middle to the point where we call them a dramedy because you can't really decide which one you should call it. But then if you think of a show like Mr. Robot, it's mainly an action adventure and like a weird speculative fiction thriller, but there's plenty of moments, like there's moments in almost every episode where you chuckle at some kind of little reference that they make or little game that they play. And, um, and then a show like WandaVision um, gets a little closer to that 50-50, but you know, it's mostly, a, it, it is a superhero, but it's this blend of kind of like, I mean, it's obviously a blend of a sort of like hyper reflexive um, TV show about TV shows, but then eventually you, you know, and I, and I watched it not knowing anything about the Marvel Cinematic Universe before. So I came into WandaVision just seeing it on the surface of what it is. And then they, they build the superhero um, tropes as the show goes along. And then like, like maybe Breaking Bad is really on the far end of something that's almost not a comedy at all but part of what makes it kind of meta modern is just little touches of of um clever sort of hyper awareness I yeah know. i would call breaking bad a, a, meta, a meta modern drama i don't think i'd have any hesitancy doing okay. that and that to me has to do with you know again as we've been talking about here a lot with these these really um conflicted ordinary sort of anti-heroes and well not sort of in this case but um very much anti-heroes and uh, also i was thinking about this is veering off into film a little bit but mumblecore you know the whole oeuvre of lynn shelton and that whole genre that is and the duke know, I, brothers yes and it's it's arguably um somewhat funny all along but certainly not made to get you chuckling per se you're just you know you're laughing along at the foibles of these human beings in these really specific tight moments you know what it is if i can interrupt um in in these mumblecore shows and maybe in some of these other meta modern shows that don't bang you over the head with the comedy um you laugh in the same way that you would laugh in real life in in a if you were in a situation like that you laugh the way the characters would be laughing for themselves and you just get to be there you know as opposed to sort of bang you over the head comedy the stuff is set up to be laughed at from the outside does that make sense i think that's right yeah i think i agree with you there because you're not like laughing at the characters you're really laughing kind of with them i feel like there's this sense of almost an embrace of the audience that i think that linda was referring to earlier that i think is very much part of that kind of sensibility too i'm, I'm really struck by thinking about breaking bad as a, a piece of meta modern because mm -hmm. i hadn't thought about that before and i i keep coming back to i was always very interested in jesse's character mm -hmm. um for me to be kind of um now again with the connection to bojack horseman yeah with I was Aaron just paul right much, yeah absolutely and so i i, I really for me I, I was always very interested in jesse as a likable uh anti-hero uh -huh. uh, much more so than walter white and, and for, for me he was a much more complex character but maybe what i meant by that was actually he was a more meta modern character mm -hmm. like walter white has a much more traditional um trajectory of kind of descent into anti-hero where by the yeah. end i mean our tolerance for for his behavior is pretty or at least mine was pretty low um, but I feel like Jesse's character was just so consistently complex. And I also thought very funny. I thought some of the best lines of the show definitely went to Jesse. Um, but I want to speak up for Walter White as the, um, you know, the the meta-modern flawed hero rather than just the simple anti-hero. 
I agree that as the show progresses, I feel less and less sympathetic to him. And yet in the final episode and the final scene, I feel like he has his redemption in a very meta modern way. Because if it was, if it was just sort of like a classic modernist story, his redemption would have actually sort of, you know, it would have been involved him reconciling with Skylar and somehow vindicating himself legally and kind of pulling all the ends together and and achieving what he had originally set out to achieve after going through this descent but um that's not the way he redeems himself he you know he redeems himself in this extremely violent act and in his own death he's reveling in his in his he he was never addicted i guess to the meth but he's he's never addicted to um imbibing meth but he's addicted he's in love with meth and his heaven is to be close to his his meth which he you know he revels in and yet he has this glimmer of morality where he gets to save jesse um and he gets to set up skylar and walt jr's future um but he's still kind of just become this irredeemable criminal as well. And and I, I felt very emotionally satisfied and complete with, with the way he died. <laughs> to me, if, if he had been redeemed, talking about Walt now, um, that would have been wrong somehow. Like you, you just couldn't let him pull out after all of that. So in that way, the show to me was, mm, whether it was a metamodern, move in the show or not mm. it, it was respectful of the right. kind of reality in which you know certain things just there's cause and effect you know so while we've talked about the um the magicalness sometimes of metamodern you know worlds or landscapes or something it's not that there isn't cause and effect that's what's so one interesting you know aspect to um these supernatural worlds where Things are happening that are very ordinary at the same time as they're happening in these strange spaces or whatever. And the so emotional like, logic is very realistic, even yeah. as the the world building is magical. Yeah. And I was just thinking of too about Breaking Bad is that the characters that you sympathize with all along, the ones that it's not really their fault, Jesse and Skylar and you know, especially Walt Jr they come out okay, Well, sort of. I don't know about the trauma of going through what they would have gone through. They True, say, oh, but they okay. relatively, they escape, so to speak. Um, they don't, don't get know. killed. Hmm? I don't know. I mean, Sky, I, I, I was so fascinated during that whole time um, with the discussions around Skylar. You know, a lot of what I do has to do with how women are likable and unlikable female characters and mm -hmm. the and the animosity towards Skylar was uh, was humongous at the time. I mean, there was just such a rage towards Skylar that she was holding Walt, uh, Walter White back. And I, I just thought that was such an interesting um, mm. and, and it's disturbing kind of, um, you know, thought about female and male antiheroes. And so I guess for me, my, um, my emotional reaction to Breaking Bad is always um, had, was shaped by that discourse very much. Um, I think Skylar was was devastated by the very end. That was the sense that I got. Though mm. it has been a few years since I've seen um, Breaking Bad. Yeah, no, I, I guess I go along with that. I, I don't think we can say they they come off scot free. They just don't get killed. He manages to okay. not get killed. <laughs> yes, that is a pro. I mean, props. To <laughs> but he sets up his family financially. Financially. That's what I'm talking about. Right. And he frees Jesse from a horrible bondage. And he wanted those things as flawed as he is and as, as limited as his vision for you know, what the great life for these people would be. He wanted those things for them out of a genuine caring within who he is. Yeah. Like his version of doing well by his family is to set them up financially and do it in a, such a way that they'll never suffer the repercussions legally. And his vision of setting things right for Jesse is getting him out of this hellish situation. And he wields everything he's got, 
it's his master play it's like the most brilliant play he does in the whole show in order to do that for them and but in sacrificing you know himself and i found something that's kind of emotionally satisfying about that i'm just coming up with this now but um you know i think a lot of shows are going to have characters who do bad things in them and the mark of a meta modern show is that they do bad things and yet you love them and you, sometimes you even love them for the bad things that they do because it's such an expression of who they really are like that's how i am with shameless is um they're just awesome they're just the whole family are are awesome and they do these dastardly things um in awesome in a meta modern sense right yeah. Which... just something that's so expressive of the suchness of itself <laughs> that all you can do is say that's awesome yeah like it's beyond a kind of moral judgments moral just that's awesome so i feel like this was the show that greg's been trying to get me into yeah months now and I just I haven't for some reason I can't I've watched the first few episodes and it just hasn't been and I've been wondering why too I mm. feel like there's a certain je ne sais quoi about the meta like what, what exactly kind of speaks to you because I can see how the meta modern qualities but I also um, for some reason it was harder for me to get into yeah mm -hmm. well the surprising thing about shameless is that it presents itself to you originally as this show about this family of people who are just bad and yet they're awesome in their badness and 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 you may come to love them um either way but then as the show goes on there's this whole other layer where it actually very seriously tackles a lot of social issues and um kind of presents the life of different kinds of marginalized people like it has one of the i think a lot of people feel this way it has one of the best depicted um male gay relationships that i've seen in television but um, not best in a sense of everyone would like to emulate because they're they're extremely, yeah they're still shitty people but <laughs> extremely um, dysfunctional you know and it, it kind of it there's even like one season where it's almost a little bit too much where like at the end of each episode they they give you these little um texts text bars going across the screen giving you like phone numbers you can call that are relevant to whatever the issue of the so you know with that aspect of it you would think it was like this very preachy social justice kind of not funny takes itself too seriously thing, but it manages, it can get away with that because it has really established itself in its irreverence um, from the beginning. And I feel like that dynamic is also metamodern. You know, as we're talking, I'm wondering about, because we, we keep using the term bad behavior to kind of describe a wide range of characters, mm -hmm. like everything from like, you know, we talked about Walter White murdering someone to someone having like one of the things that I love about The Good Place is Chidi's character who's just I mean he just is really anxious all the time and that really just impedes his ability to make choices and so it's interesting to me because I think that when it, as a viewer I think I have much more um, compassion and sympathy for dysfunctional characters mm -hmm. that don't necessarily have a cruel streak and I feel like for me when I was thinking about metamodernism I feel like it leans in that direction but I've been persuaded by this conversation mm -hmm. that maybe a more um a, a more dynamic way to kind of think about that that metamodernism isn't just one thing that it actually mm -hmm. does a wide range of critical ways of thinking about bad behavior um, i wanted to just somehow segue over to um teaching empathy how I, and i'm curious as a teacher myself how you frame the study of empathy do you sort of you know do you group genres or or look through certain theoretical lenses like postmodernism or um, what like what guides your choices of what to study and your your analyses? I'm sure you could go on for a long time about this, but maybe you can give us just a tiny snapshot. So I think the biggest thing that that I can say about what I sort of do in the classroom is, you know, I want I want students and I want people in general to think about what they themselves are bringing to the table as the consumer of media. I think that oftentimes we really talk a lot about the creator and their role in generating empathy. There seems to be this idea that oh, if it's done well. 
it will automatically elicit this empathetic reaction in viewers. And I think that my research really um, pushes back against that a little bit. I think um, one of the things that we've been doing in my classes is thinking about empathy as a potential skill, which is a lot of where um, some, some neuroscientists and psychologists are going in that direction, thinking that empathy is something that you can practice yeah. and practice by engaging a wider range of media, practice by kind of working on different kinds of empathy skills like listening, which we tend to sometimes not think of as such an active kind of skill, but it definitely requires a lot of um, active thinking. And so that's a lot of the conversation we have in my classes. So I know one activity that we do um, is I actually ask students to watch or read, or they can kind of do in any kind of text that they want, where they themselves are not the primary audience of that text. And that ends up having a really interesting conversation about, oh, well, how do I determine if I'm meant to be the audience for this particular text? And that kind of cracks open that, you know, what's it like to be, you know, for an 18 year old student, for example, to watch something that's intended for an audience that's in their 60s versus something that they're maybe more used to seeing kind of on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And what's it like for any of us to kind of be thinking about? Um, so for me, that's one of the ways that I like to get, um, get my students kind of thinking more deeply about empathy and kind of being exposed to, because one thing that I feel very strongly about is that being exposed to a wide range of text is an important part of not just media literacy, but also just becoming an informed, um, I guess this is the wrong way to put it, but an informed consumer, but also someone who's just thinking deeply about empathy on a daily basis. I think kind of to put it short, um, I think that we often assume that empathy is something that, we'll have, that we'll, we'll experience empathy when it's done well for us. And I, I don't really think that's the case. So to circle back to Breaking Bad, I think part of that has to do with, you know, cultural attitudes and assumptions about women, about how women should respond to male bad behavior, um, about, I mean, I, I certainly, Skylar was not a perfect character. There were many things that she did that were incredibly flawed, but I thought that the response to her bad behavior was there was so much animosity versus there was a lot more sympathy for Walter White's bad behavior, even when it was very clear that he was doing much worse things, you know, unequivocally mm -hmm. than Skylar ever did. And so, for me, I think thinking about our own emotional response is a way to kind of get at some of those some of those ideas. Super interesting. Thanks. I think it it's probably about time that we wrap up, and um, we've really covered a lot of interesting uh, topics. But um, Ariel, do you have anything any any last words that you want to share? Oh no, just to say that I really enjoyed this conversation. You know, my biggest passions, um, you know, as I was saying before, have to do with, you know, thinking about empathy on screen and thinking about empathy in the different works that we read. And so for me, discovering this term has been so um, phenomenally helpful to kind of think about, um, you know, the stuff that I'm most interested in, the things that I'm most passionate about. And so it's been just such a pleasure to be speaking to both of you today. And yeah. Thank you so much. It's been yeah. a real pleasure to speak with you also and to talk about these, these shows that we've, you know, long admired or uh, that, frankly, that a lot of them that we still want to write about and haven't gotten around to writing about yet. So hopefully we'll have more, uh, more conversation in the future. Yeah, thank you. Um, and goodbye. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.